Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here, and welcome back to the Sword and Sorcery Saga and our continuing coverage of the Elric Saga from Michael Moorcock. And today we are going to take a look at the next two books, books three and four. And those books are The Weird of the White Wolf and The Vanishing Tower. Um, in books three and four of the Elric saga, um, they deal with uh, El Elric's exploits as he continues to uh, basically seal his doom while traveling throughout the young kingdoms. And these stories specifically kind of focus on his travels and adventures with his companion Moonglum. And each of these uh, two books is made up of three novellas. They are loosely tied together with kind of an overarching plot in which Elric is chasing down his kind of arch rival in the series who just kind of comes out of nowhere in a kind of a weird way, this evil sorcerer from Pan Tang. So Weird of the White Wolf, uh, book three, we're just going to jump right into it here. And uh, this is from uh, 1977 that it was originally published. And I'm going to read the back of the Ace Fantasy book, my reader's copy, my reading copy. And this says, The albino emperor meets Queen Yashana. Now sword and man are one. Elric's awesome loneliness, ironically, is ended. And the eternal champion and his blade Stormbringer must go forth through havoc and horror to carve out their destiny. So this volume contains uh, two of the very earliest Elric stories that were written and published. And it kind of exemplifies one of the issues I brought up in my original video about the kind of tonal and style inconsistencies. Um, the stories here do feel a little rough around the edges, and it's kind of weird coming from like books one and two, which you would think were earlier, and you would, you would expect a, a series as it went to get better in terms of style, prose, and consistency. But here, because the publishing order and the, the, the internal uh, chronological order was so jumbled up while Moorcock was working on the story, that's not actually the case here. So uh, these stories aren't bad. They're just not as polished as the stories we've already read in the series, at least in, court, uh, in, in my opinion. Um, and this is simply due to Moorcock becoming better, uh, a better writer as time went on, perhaps having a better grasp of the character and his own style and really the themes that are present in, in, in these stories. In contrast to how the stories were written and published, really, and that's just kind of, it's just the nature of Elric. And while this has always been my least favorite of the six core Elric books, it does contain one novella, one section that I absolutely love. So the book here, it begins with a prologue, and uh, the prologue is called The Dream of Earl Abek. And um, here it says that we learn something of how the age of the young kingdoms emerged. And this prologue gives us a bit of the mythological history of Elric's world. And it is one of the kind of few rare examples of Moorcock concerning himself with world building. At some point, I should probably do a whole episode about my feelings on world building. Uh, here they are kind of just in a very small <laughs> nutshell. Um, I don't like how obsessed modern fantasy authors and fans of modern fantasy are with world building. World building does really does almost nothing for me in the modern context of it. I rarely care about the history, the language, the magical systems, the politics, or the, the geography, or the economics of fictional worlds. And this is one of the reasons why I love the Elric stories so much, and one of the reasons why I do tend to prefer older fantasy so much. You know, Moorcock almost never pauses the plot to tell the readers about these things. He throws around proper nouns of people and places uh, like they're going out of style and basically just asks the reader to keep up. He almost never gives us context to what is happening and we just kind of have to fill in a lot of the blanks for ourselves. And so I, I appreciate that in, in a work of fantasy and um, a lot of modern fantasy. I call it, kind of call it like the Brian Saunderson um, 
problem where they're just so full of world building and and describing in detail magical systems it was like a uh, modern fantasy writers they looked at tolkien's the cimmerillion and said yes this is the blueprint for all modern fantasy uh going forward and and that just it, yeah, it just really does nothing for me so i am i am glad that elric is is is, is short on the world building but the first proper story here is called The Dreaming City. And if you remember in uh, the first video, I remarked about the irony of Elric's optimism when he stated he would be a new man when he returned home. Well, this is what I was referring to. Uh, this story tells of how Elric returned to his home city, his home region, his kingdom, and basically destroyed the entire city with a band of pirates, of, of raiders and he killed his cousin. He accidentally kills the love of his life and basically burns and raises his home country to the ground. And I, I think here it's pretty apparent that Moorcock is kind of giving the middle finger to fantasy's obsession with tradition and the past. He's making a statement with Elric that Elric is going to burn down the kind of fantasy that had come before it. And this is kind of like Moorcock's statement here. It's very blunt, it's very on the nose. But again, I think this was coming from a younger, uh, a younger writer. And uh, I feel like this story really is Moorcock stating his thematic goals with the Elric saga. Uh, the second story we have here is called While the Gods Laugh. And this is the one that I love the most. I think this story is absolutely fantastic. I'm here. Um, I think it's here that Morcock gives Elric his real purpose. In this story, Elric and Moonglum join forces with a woman named Sharilla. And together they embark on a quest for the Dead God's Book. And this is a book that might contain the knowledge of the gods and the cosmos. Uh, Elric becomes obsessed with reading the book so he can discover the answer to an age-old question. Is there an ultimate God reigning over all creation? Is there a purpose to anything? Is there something outside the constant manipulation of the gods and the orders of law and chaos? And this story really does introduce Elric's um, existential quest for the answers to life's greatest mysteries. And like most of Elric's endeavors, it ends in utter failure and doom. So I wanted to read a little bit about that here. Um, so this is from page 77 of the Ace Paperback Edition. And um, he says, uh, very well then, Elric said eventually, but it is not easy to answer you in a few sentences. I desire, if you like, to know one of two things. He's talking to uh, Sharilla about why he wants to find this book. And she asks, and what is that, Elric? The tall albino dropped the folded tent to the grass and sighed. His fingers played nervously with the pommel of his rune sword. Can an ultimate god exist or not? That is what I need to know, Sharilla. If my life is to have any direction at all, the lords of law and chaos now govern our lives, but is there some being greater than them? Sharilla put her hand on Elric's arm. Why must you know, she said. Despairingly, sometimes, I seek the comfort of a benign god, Sharilla. My mind goes out, lying awake at night, searching through black barrenness for something, anything, which will take me to it, warm me, protect me, tell me that there is order in the chaotic tumble of the universe, that it is consistent, this precision of the planets, not simply a brief, bright spark of sanity in an eternity of malevolent anarchy. Elric's side with his quiet tones were tinged with hopelessness. Without some confirmation of the order of things, my only comfort is to accept the anarchy. This way I can revel in chaos and know without fear that we are all doomed from the start, that our brief existence is both meaningless and damned. 
So I really like that that dialogue exchange and Elric really a, kind of as an angsty character kind of lays it all on the line there. But the story is not all existential dread. This story is overflowing with the kind of questing adventure I love and uh, we love as, as uh, viewers of the Dungeon Dive love. And uh, this would make a fantastic RPG module. You get caves, underground lakes, strange and otherworldly locations, magic puzzles and loot. And Moonglum also adds some much needed levity to Elric's brooding, and the two make a very interesting adventuring pair. The final novel in The Weird of the White Wolf is The Singing Citadel, and this should be especially interesting for fans of game, Games Workshop's The Silver Tower. So longtime viewers of the Dungeon Dive will know how much uh, I love that game. In this story, Elric basically travels to a dungeon that is the Silver Tower. And uh, this must have been a great inspiration for Games Workshop and uh, in the development of the god, the Chaos God Sinch. Uh, in this novel, we're introduced to two important players in Elric's saga that will reappear from time to time. And they are Queen Yashana and Thalab Karna, a wizard of Pantang, which I mentioned earlier, kind of in a, in a kind of offbeat, weird way, becomes Elric's kind of arch enemy in this saga. Uh, so with Elric in the mix, these three form a kind of strange love triangle embroiled in treachery, passion, backstabbing, and sorcery. In this novella, Elric infiltrates a magical fortress, aka the Silver Tower, to do battle with Lord ba Balo. Uh, he is a lord of the higher realms, kind of a mix between Loki and the gaunt summoner from Silver Tower, whose goal it is to, and I quote, establish my own realm on earth, a realm of paradox, uh, a little from law and a little from chaos, a realm of opposites, of curiosities and jokes. And once again, Elric finds himself as a pawn and just a plaything of the Lords of Law and Chaos. Really, really cool story. Really good ending to the Weird of the White Wolf. So coming up next and last today is The Vanishing Tower, also published in 1977. And I'm going to read the back of the Ace Paperback version here. And this is The Gateway. Elric Cursed and Beloved of the Gods follows his black hellblade stormbringer into the vanishing tower gateway to the myriad planes of earth and time and to countless hells that are his destiny uh the, the again this book is comprised of three novellas and this has always been one of my favorite elric books i like all three stories in here straight out of the gate uh, the writing and style in this collection is a huge improvement over The Weird of the White Wolf. You could tell that Moorcock was a more seasoned, more comfortable, more confident writer, more confident in his capabilities as an author. And uh, both the characters and the plots are better for it. So while Weird of the White Wolf uh, ranks as one of my least favorites, uh, this definitely is, like I said, one of my most favorites. It has some truly amazing chapter titles well that are just screaming to be made uh, song titles for like a folk metal band like Agaloc or something or uh, Runes of Beverast. Uh, this says like, here's some chapter examples. Uh, Pale Prince on a Moonlit Shore, Feathers Filling a Great Sky, Old Castle Standing Alone, black wizard laughing um, a great host screaming the stolen ring the cold ghouls uh, just fantastic totally metal uh chapter titles uh, titles i love it and once again moorcock just crams more plot into this single volume than many authors do in a series ranging thousands of pages long this short volume under 200 pages is absolutely overflowing with amazing fantasy action otherworldly locales and strange beings uh, the three novellas here are The Torment of the Last Lord, To Snail, To, to Snail, <laughs> To Snare the Pale Prince, and Three Heroes with a Single Aim. All three are structurally similar. They are all very basic kind of questing stories. And all three feature, uh, yeah, they just, they feature a traditional questing plot in which Elric and Moongum, Moonglum are hired or coerced into some kind of harrowing situation. 
Uh, the Torment of the Last Lord contains one of the all-time just kind of gross and nasty magical spells. It's called the Noose of Flesh. And if you've seen or read um, Akira, the Japanese uh, manga or anime, yeah, imagine at the end of that how um, Tetsuo is kind of exploding in this uh, weird just giant globule of flesh and enveloping everybody around him. That's what this noose of flesh does. It's really, really cool. Um, to to uh, snare a pale prince has a villain and an atmosphere that fans of From Software game will absolutely adore. If you like games like uh, Demon Souls or Dark Souls or Oh man, in like 10, 15 days, uh, Elden Ring, uh, rip the dungeon dive. Well, once Elden Ring comes out, uh, you will absolutely love this chapter and um, this uh, section here. The, so in book two, to snare a the pale prince, chapter one of the beggar court. I'm just going to read a little bit about this. This is about a city of beggars called Nadsko, Nadsukar. And it was infamous throughout the young kingdoms lying near the shores of that ferocious river, the Varkalk, and not too far from the kingdom of Org, in which blossomed the frightful fortress of Trues, and exuding the stink which seemed thick enough ten miles distance, Nadsukar was plagued by few visitors. So as you can see, just in that very first paragraph, Moorcock mentions a bunch of places that we have no idea. He's not concerned with world building. He is concerned with setting up an atmosphere and just dropping, sprinkling in names of things to give the world a sense of place, but without bogging down the story. But this goes on to describe the king of the beggars. Uh, their king had ruled for many years. He was called Urish the seven-fingered, for he had but four fingers on his right hand and three upon his left. Veins had burst all over his once handsome face, and filthy infested hair framed that seedy countenance upon which age and grime had traced a thousand lines. From out of all this ruin peered two bright pale eyes. As the symbol of his power, Orish had a great cleaver called Hackme, which was forever at his side. His throne was of crudely carved black oak, studded with bits of raw gold, bones, and semi-precious gems. Beneath the throne was Urish's hoard, a chest of treasure, which he let alone, which he let none but himself look upon. Totally just a villain, a, a boss, straight out of a Dark Souls or Demon Souls game. Absolutely love that. And that is also just a fantastic story there. And then we have the, the three heroes with a single aim further examines in, in quite a bit of detail the nature of the metaverse of which Elric is a part of his um, Moorcock's metaverse, which all of these characters are kind of the uh, different incarnate of the eternal champion. Here, Elric again teams up with various in, 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 um, incarnations of the eternal champion and how each is doing his part in their own individual realms, but they're also kind of working together to save the, ver the very fabric of space and time. Uh, the city of Tantalorn also plays an important role in this book. We learn a little bit about its place outside of the reacher reaches of powers of law and chaos. Uh, it is a refuge for people who are tired of being the pawns in a cosmic game played by opponents oblivious to the lives of those they are manipulating. It is a place of peace, of refuge. It is a place that I find appealing today. I wish a place like this existed. Um, a place where people could just live their lives in peace outside of the influence of religion and politics. It's a place of humanity. It's a place of compassion, of caring, because we don't have to worry about these external forces that are constantly beating us down. And that's really why Elric wants to find this place. Uh, the city but when he finds it I think he kind of gets bored with it he gets bored without having some kind of uh, anger or drama in his life and so the stories in this volume they're, they're, they're the kind that really tickle my imagination each one of these could easily be the basis for an adventure game or an RPG model these are perfect examples of the kind of fantasy I love stories about weird characters strange locales otherworldly powers told with brevity uh, plotted with a kind of reckless abandon one might find in a 90s Hong Kong action film 
if you stop to really think about what's going on, it doesn't make a ton of sense because you have to fill in a ton of dots and things seem to be kind of scattered, uh, scattershot all over the place. Um, as the characters, they don't have a ton of agency in what they're doing. But when I let my mind be swept away by the momentum of the plot and the strangeness of the atmosphere, I can't help but read these stories with a huge smile on my face. And with The Vanishing Tower, that is especially too true. I did have a smile on my face almost the entire time I was reading this. So much great adventure and atmosphere and just really cool, weird things happening. So, all right, guys, well, uh, next time we will take a look at books five and six and then we will move on to maybe um, I think a couple extra little short stories with Elric and a couple of the novels that Moorcock wrote later to kind of go back in and plug some holes so take it easy guys we will talk to you later bye bye